Today we're changing gears a little bit, uh, as we've been trying to do with, uh, with these presentations. And Tim Cohen here is uh, going to talk about Rancho Temescal. And I won't steal any of his thunder and describe it, uh, other than to say um, it's a uh, horsey operation, which is not something that I think you've heard about uh, before. And, uh, and he'll, we're going to learn more about thoroughbreds and horses probably than, uh, than we have uh, then, although some of you I know are horse people, and, and it might not be new to you, but uh, for most of you it probably will be. So uh, he's also a real important part of the Pyro community, and I'm sure he'll talk a little bit about the things that he's been doing out there. So uh, with that, Tim, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for coming. And if I start talking very quickly, it's only because usually I get three minutes up here and I'm facing that way. <laughs> so it's, it's usually a bad habit, but I'm, I'm going to see what I can do here. Um, five, yeah. <laughs> Wait, can I turn and get the other three? No. Uh, so um, just a little bit about me so that you kind of understand where I'm coming from or where I've been. Um, I'm a little different than some of the other speakers that you've had from the agricultural community. Um, I'm not a fifth generation, fourth generation, or any generation farmer. Um, I came from a hospitality background. I used to uh, run restaurants uh, for Hilton Hotels, Hyatt Hotels, uh, jazz clubs, um, uh, some nice restaurants, some not so nice restaurants, and some nice hotels, and some hotels that I wish were nice. And so I can tell you, honestly, I never woke up from any dream wishing to be a farmer. Um, but, but here I am, and, and I think that's, that's a lot about life. Uh, we kind of find ourselves wherever we go, and, and uh, I'm really happy uh, where I am. So uh, if, if for some reason you have any questions in the middle, I'm talking, something's intriguing, feel free to just go, hey, Tim, question about that. Um, uh, I don't have any problems, so just stop me any time. And so with that, um, I will see how I do. Excellent. So Rancho Temescal itself was founded in uh, 1843. It was part of a larger Spanish land grant, uh, encompassed 13,339 acres. Um, as you know it today would be part of uh, what we call Rancho Temescal in Ventura County. Uh, Rancho Temescal in LA County, which is another uh, 6,000, 5,000 acres, and Rancho Camulos. And so the three of those comprised uh, really what was at the time a Spanish land grant. Um, it was founded by David Cook. Uh, he came from Illinois. He was the son of a Methodist minister. Um, I think he wasn't exactly living the way his father wanted him, so he sent him to California uh, to come out and make the second Garden of Eden. And so with that, he planted oranges, apricots, walnuts, figs, grapes, and uh, pomegranates um, on, on the property. Um, this is a, a newspaper, actually, um, I purchased from uh, Harry Leckler. Uh, Leckler uh, Museum was in um, Piru a long time ago. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of uh, Piru uh, items were auctioned off, but I was fortunate to, to buy this. And it's uh, uh, the Ventura Free Press from July 25, 1899. And it speaks to the Piru Fruit Rancho, which is what our property is now, uh, and speaks to mammoth orchards, uh, perfect irrigation system, which I've never seen one, and, uh, and Pyro itself as a distribution point for uh, oil. And again, this back in 1899. So in 2001 is about the time uh, we purchased uh, the property, my family. And um, I kind of wanted to give you an idea of what we did. Um, in 2001, we planted um, about 100 acres of avocados and lemons. Um, we ran about um, nine miles of 12-inch irrigation pipe. Nine miles. That's, that's an awful lot. Um, the nine miles service about 600 acres of uh, irrigated lands. And uh, about 12 miles of five-strand uh, fencing. Keep uh, the folks out and the critters in. And um, basically, it took about a year and a half to do that. And we used two different companies for each task. So we we kind of put two fence companies against each other, see who could get it done quicker, and, uh, and two trenching companies to see uh, who could get it done quicker as well. This is just the start of the equestrian center. Um, it's located just below the dam. And, uh, you know, we kind of took pictures as we went along just to see how things were going. Eventually, which you'll see, we were um, building two houses for our staff, a uh, main barn, two mare motels. Uh, a mare motel is like an in and out, in and out for a horse. So it's a 12 by 24, so 12 feet by 24 
12 feet are covered, 12 feet are open. And so it gives the horse a chance to get some sun on its back, obviously a little bit more room. And uh, it, it's really healthy for, uh, for horses to do that. Um, the best place to keep a horse is outside. Um, that's where they want to be. Even in a hailing rainstorm, we have covers. And the cover might be here, and they're just right over here. <laughs> it's amazing, but that's what they do. Um, the other things we, uh, we're putting in this area, which comprised of uh, this front area, is about 75 acres. Um, some additional pasture, pastures, uh, a round pen, a hay barn, and a shop. Now, in 2001, we also planted um, a deciduous orchard, which is a little unique to Ventura County now, but wasn't back in, in the early 1900s. Um, we planted a, a variety of different crops to determine what may or may not work well. And um, we had about two or three different varieties of peaches, uh, two varieties of pluots, which was a cross between a plum and an apricot. And in 2001, that was pretty nifty and new. Now it's boring and old. And that, that's kind of tells you about agriculture, too. Uh, and also some apricots. Um, a little bit about the deciduous orchard, why you don't see it in Ventura County, is it requires 600 chill hours in a season. And so basically what that means is the tree won't fruit, won't react well, unless it's really dormant and for an extended period of time. And so typically we get our chill hours between um, 2 and 4 a.m. Is, is our coldest but if we can get a longer cold spell, we need to get those 600 hours in, um, typically between November and, and March. If we don't get that, we end up with beautiful trees but no fruit. Um, now, the other unique thing about deciduous, um, which, which I learned, sometimes uh, by nature I'm a little entrepreneurial. I, I never like to do what the next guy does, but there's a reason why you do. <laughs> I'll explain that. <laughs> But um, a deciduous tree has to be treated entirely different. Um, it's pruned differently. It's picked differently. Um, it reacts differently. requires different types of uh, uh, foliage sprays. Um, it's just something unique to a lemon or an avocado that we're all accustomed to. So the gentleman who um, actually came down and, and helped me with my deciduous trees knew nothing about lemon and avocado trees, but he knew about how to take care of the stone fruit. And, of course, a very smart individual. So he learned about the avocados and lemons and taught me a lesson why I should never do deciduous. Um, one of the other components about deciduous that's unique is um, the, the pit. Uh, imagine the pit like a microwave. And so when you pick that fruit, that pit is radiating heat. You, know, you ever get in the market and you get a mushy peach or something? It's because they didn't chill the pit down quick enough. And so what you have to do is you have to time the fruit to have enough sugar in it so that it's tasty, but not so ripe that it's going to start getting mealy. And, and what does that is the heat of the pit. So you actually have to take that fruit as soon as you pick it, run it down to the packing house, and run it through this chilling freezer that pushes air through the fruit, through the packaging. It's very expensive. Very hard to do, and what really is terrible is if you're the guy picking it in 100 degree weather, <laughs> and you're the guy in the cooler running it through, you're going to catch pneumonia. Learned that the first year. <laughs> so um, we, uh, it, it was a lot of fun. I, I guess that's what you would say. Uh, <laughs> now I, I'll give you a little. Um, if you can take a look, you can see that's June 13th, 2001, and if you can kind of see the size of the trees. And, and that's exactly one year later. And you can see the growth in the tree. Um, a deciduous fruit tree uh, will yield 100% in year three. Um, so in, in year two, we'll get about 15 or 20%, which is kind of good, right? You get some cash in your income. Um, to give you a comparison, avocados take seven years to mature uh, to get to about full production. A lemon tree, maybe five years. So um, you're a little quicker with the stone fruit. Uh, the density is, is much more, too. But um, it, it, uh, it likes really kind of rocky ground, right, which is good. Avocados like rocky ground. Uh, avocados don't like wet feet. They don't like to sit in their own water or anything like that. It's, it's not healthy. And same thing with the stone fruit. Um, but you need the combination of extreme cold and extreme heat. And uh, there's very few places in Ventura County that get that except lovely Piru. And... Um, that's why you see most of this fruit built, uh, grown in Central California, in the Central Valley. So here we are, uh, gosh, about uh, nine months later, and we're, we're working away on the equestrian center, and you can kind of see what's coming. Uh, in the foreground here is one of the uh, 
homes for the workers, hay barn, uh, our main barn, uh, roping arenas, um, and some pasture coming into play. And so um, in the upper right-hand corner, this is always a fun one, right up in here, there are two water tanks. And of course, they're not the topic of the year. Um, <laughs> to, to give you an idea, uh, we store about 1.5 million gallons of water in, in our ranch uh, between four tanks and the nine miles of pipe. Um, we use up to three million gallons of water in a day. So I know you guys are all smart and you're like, how do you get there? Right? We can input about 2.1 million gallons of water a day. So if I lose a day of input, I'm in trouble. And so our system is always, we're always balancing catch up, empty, fill, empty, fill. And it isn't like a faucet um, where you can kind of manage it because I have so many different faucets that need to be irrigated at different times. I also have tenants um, that want water. And uh, we also balance our ranch between, we farm our own trees and the row crops I lease out. And so when they want, everybody wants water at the same time, and you can't do that either, right? So it's like a big management uh, uh, opportunity. <laughs> and so I thought I'd show you this uh, because, one, there's water in the lake, and I just thought, well, isn't that nice? Uh, <laughs> and also, um, just to kind of give you, um, if you still aren't certain where we are, we're, that's, that's basically us right below the dam. Uh, the ranch itself does... Uh, encompass about 2,500 acres around the lake and about 3,200 acres below the lake, um, before the, below the spillway. Um, that particular spot's really great at the dam brace because all the water's going to go past it. So we're, we're okay. Not that that will ever happen. Um, right down here at the bottom, boop, boop, there we go, um, you'll see the start of an arena. And then right in between is a terraced um, seating berm. So for uh, sporting events that we were putting on the thing, on the uh, equestrian center, you'd have like a seven-foot cut, little vertical, seven-foot cut, little vertical. So you could have people sitting down, having picnics, uh, watching what's going on in the, uh, in the arenas. So that was kind of fun for everybody. A little hard to mow, but, but we got there. And again, I just thought, gosh, <laughs> it's been so long since I've seen green, I wanted to put that one up there too. <laughs> and of course, that's all rain-induced. That's not irrigation. Um, and you can see here, we're almost built out um, up on the uh, upper part right here. These are avocados. And then right down below here is our stone fruit. And again, the avocados are on the hillsides uh, for drift. You don't want freeze. We need air to move through. Uh, avocados are very sensitive to the cold. Um, lemons are less sensitive to the cold. So sometimes you might see a lemon or an avocado orchard right nearby each other. And one's been damaged by the frost, and the other one hasn't. It's probably because it was a lemon. Um, but they're both susceptible. Um, and again, you know, cold sits, right? And so, again, that's why we had the stone fruit at the bottom, and we were hoping that it would sit there. And it actually did. Um, this is uh, in 2003. So, again, we, start, we bought the ranch in 2001. Uh, we were up and running in 2003. Um, I would have to say that uh, the permitting process was very good. Uh, the CUP wasn't that great, but the but building the buildings was great. So we, uh, we had a lot of fun. Um, and so the events that we held in the equestrian center were ropings, cuttings, team pennings, and thoroughbreds. And uh, this is a picture of a roping uh, in the right-hand corner. People would come in, trailers. Um, you know, it's kind of funny. We would do like those two-night events, and you always, you know, from the movies, you'd always see some guys taking a bath in the water trough. It happens. <laughs> it's not fake. They do it. It's amazing, but they do. Um, and so, uh, a lot of fun. Uh, people seem to really enjoy it, but um, uh, it was a terrible business model. Uh, it just never worked. Um, and and one of the things I'm going to kind of go through are all the failures today, because um, I want you to understand that that probably. Well, maybe it's just my luck, but probably half of what I do fails, and the other half does okay. So um, one of the things about the equestrian center that we eventually found out um, is uh, location was okay uh, because we were between some major uh, areas, but the Burbank Equestrian Center, uh, which is a, a state sponsor type of deal, they get $75 to rent the arena. I couldn't even water it for $75, and they have better arenas. And, and so it was uh, um, it's one of those deals, if that's your passion, you would do it. Uh, I wasn't passionate about 
about this. Uh, one of my partners was, but he wasn't around and I was. And so at the end of the day, if it wasn't something that I was passionate about, it was hard for me to, to keep going. And uh, at the same time, our thoroughbred population was smaller. Uh, we had just started. So the, the two were somewhat compatible at, at, at some point and then incompatible at, at another point. And so, again, you make a choice as to what you want to do. But I did have a CUP. <laughs> All right. So um, another business that we, uh, we tried that uh, was a lot of fun was uh, much like City Slickers. We did uh, Dude Ranch Vacations. So people would come out. Uh, we ran a two-night to five-night program for adults, families, kids, you name it. Um, and again, um, kind of with my background in the hospitality industry, I, I, I did a lot of hotel sales as well, group and, and individual sales. And so I, I thought, gosh, you know, this would be great. You're an hour from L.A., Right? I kind of thought the dinks, you know, the double income, no kids, they could finish their job at 5, sit down and have dinner with the cowboy in Piru by 7, ride all day Saturday, get fed, stay Saturday night, ride half day Sunday and be home, never have to get on a plane, get to ride 6,000 acres, push cattle. I thought, gosh, that's my market. Right? But it wasn't. Um, <laughs> I would say probably 30% of my clients came from Europe, which was, which was shocking. Uh, 30% from the East Coast, uh, about 10% from the Midwest, and the balance from California. And so, yeah, kind of surprising. Uh, I had some great cowboys. Um, I had one guy who uh, uh, writes songs and is a singer and uh, very personable. I had another one that was just 130% cowboy and, and didn't like to talk to people much, but, <laughs> but he did. And uh, so I was really proud of him, and, uh, and, he, and he did a great job. Uh, the other thing I kind of thought was funny is uh, people would come out, and they'd ride for a bit, but I had one, one family that just wanted to string barbed wire. They thought that was the cat's meow, and I'd go, come on. And so we put them in gloves and let them string barbed wire, and they paid me for it. I thought, <laughs> I'm thinking I was on to something, right? But uh, I couldn't find another one. Uh, you know, they come out and drive tractors. That's fun. You know, you get a lot of people that, that are um, behind a desk or – or just don't really physically get something done, and, and that's important, I think, to a lot of people. And um, so we gave it a good shot, and, um, and we kept on going. And that was in 2002. So the other component is where did they stay, All right? And so um, we saw an opportunity in Piru, which was the old um, retirement home. I don't know if anybody's familiar. It was the Round Rock Retirement Home. And so we bought that and uh, remodeled remodeled it and got a CUP in six months. So again, um, I, I was very pleased with the process and, and how it turned out. We bought it, it was 15 bedrooms, three bathrooms. And when we were done, it was 11 bedrooms, 12 bathrooms, a commercial kitchen and a dining room. And uh, people loved it. Um, they had a great time. Um, basically, again, we used it for the overnight component of the Dude Ranch. Um, we got quite a bit of business from the Fillmore and Western uh, when they were on their trains, uh, their holiday trains, their uh, Margarita Madness. Um, they, were, they were a good supplier of business for us. Um, certainly people going to the lake um, that didn't want to camp but still wanted to go to the lake in the morning. That was, that was nice. And then uh, Rancho Camulos, which is uh, nearby down the road, uh, as a wedding venue. And um, as a marketing guy, I, I always love free advertising. Um, and here we are in Sunset Magazine. Uh, we had a great, great spread in Sunset. Um, uh, you can see some of the people riding on the, the thing, a little doggy right there, and, and some people sitting on the porch, and, and uh, a, a great write-up in Sunset. I mean, you just can't pay for stuff like that, right? And then, boom, same thing. We're in the front page of the New York Times, Travel Edition Valentine's Day Weekend. I'm like, oh, my goodness, I made it, right? <laughs> it's as good as it can get. But with all of that, um, it just didn't work. And, um, you know, so, the, so you think, okay, well, what, what are we going to do about that? And, and just like anything else, you know, you have to adapt. You have to figure out what went wrong and either change it or decide, you, know, you call it a day. And so on the Dude Ranch, I, you know, I, I couldn't quite figure it out because I thought it was a pretty good concept. I thought it was good just being so close to L.A., um, what I found was that the people wanted to stay on the ranch, not in town. And in this county, we can't do that uh, because of the commercial uh, kitchens. And so I thought we could overcome that, but, but we didn't. Um, and that's not the reason why it failed. But um, 
I, I think it was a, a large component of it. I went to Alice All Ranch before we closed it to see what they were doing. And uh, the other component was that maybe we were just too real. Uh, because, you know, you go on the Alice All and you, you sit there and you do this. And, and that's great because they're full and they've been there for 50 million years. Right? And we thought we'd do a different kind of experience where you're, you're really into it, really pushing cattle. I mean, people want to castrate, they castrate. They want to brand, we'd brand. Um, so I thought it would be something different, but, but that was okay. Um, it didn't work out, and so the cowboy moved on. Uh, some of the horses moved on, and uh, the cows certainly moved on. And then um, with the hotel, um, it has morphed into uh, probably a higher and better use all the way around. Um, it is now an uh, alcohol and drug treatment facility. And it's, uh, and it's serving a great purpose um, in the community um, at large. And so um, it was something we tried and, and failed. So not all is good. Um, and then so a little bit more back to agriculture. I guess I'm talking longer than I thought I would. Sorry. Uh, I'll get to the horses. Um, ag. I mean, we're, out in the, we're outside. We deal with whatever we get, right? So in, uh, between 2003 and 2007, I, I got Mother Nature a lot of different ways. So in 2003, we had a fire. Burned about 3,000 acres. Burned about seven miles of fence. Um, but the upside was it opened up a bunch of ground. I got to see some of the ranch I never could because of the brush. And certainly a lot more feed on the ground for cattle. So I've, I've learned that fire isn't really the worst thing in the world. A bad fire is bad, but a good fire is good. Um, and there's a fine line between the two. Um, so then in 2005, we had a flood. Now, of course, that was preceded by the fire, which put everything into these barrancas. Then we had this big flood, and everything came down. I, I don't know who works in, in county works and streets and rivers and watersheds. I mean, you guys had a nightmare, and so did we. Um, so then uh, that took us about six months to clean up. I had two excavators two dozers, three loaders, two bobcats, four dump trucks, and a partridge in a pear tree <laughs> for about two months every day. That was the peak. It was amazing. Uh, luckily, we had flood insurance, but, of course, we don't anymore because we made a claim. <laughs> so um, here again, um, we talk about adapting, right? So here's our deciduous orchard. Um, you can see kind of a little bit. You can see the tree trunk here. Um, this is about a year before, uh, about six months before the flood. And now you can see the deciduous orchard here, and you can see how much mud and uh, debris came in. And so what happened was the deciduous orchard became flooded and infected. And so with that, um, the only way to get that dirt from the tree stem is by hand. Okay? So we have... 12,000 deciduous trees that I've got to somehow get 12 inches and 18 inches of silt out of, and then by hand dig out 12,000 trees. Now, the first year was kind of interesting with the deciduous um, because our first crop year, I'm sorry, was small, and I was able to sell a box of fruit for about $12. Uh, I sold it to Craig Underwood, and he resold it, and I thought, well, this is okay. This isn't too bad. But the second year, I had exponential amount of fruit that Craig Underwood couldn't give away, right? So now I'm becoming a commercial grower. Before I was a boutique grower because I didn't have that much product, and I can get down the flatbed truck and get rid of it. Now I've got trucks and trucks of fruit. Well, the same fruit that I got $12 for from Craig, I only got $7 for commercially because then I had to go through another packer, another marketer, another guy eventually to the product. And so I was thinking, well, that's not a very good idea um, because... I was at full production, and either the price had to double or my production had to double to break even. So, I'm, okay, opportunity, right? Because I think it just isn't going to work. And then I'm thinking, I now know why there's no other deciduous orchards in Ventura County because <laughs> they don't make any money, right? And it's hard to do. So what do we do? We turn the orchard into pasture because all of a sudden, before, it was so rocky, I couldn't put a horse out there. Now I've got 18 inches of silt. I've got really good pasture ground, right? So that's what we did. We turned it, and we, and we, we put it into horses. Um, now, the good thing about the horses is um, there, there, are no, there aren't very good economics in horses. Um, and so with the stone fruit, I had anticipation of income. With the horses, I just, 
you just don't anticipate it. It's really not something that is going to be economically beneficial. And so they, they are now meeting my expectations. <laughs> so um, now we go into 2007 because I just got out of the flood in 05, right? And so here we go again. We're burning. Um, and what I kind of wanted to show you in this picture is a little bit of a freeze pattern. Um, remember I was telling you that the cold air sits and, and higher elevation is warm air. And that's why you see these wind machines here. What they're intending to do is push the cold air out of an orchard to allow the warm air in. Well, what was unique in 2007 was the air above was colder than the air below. So what would happen to us, and this happened to almost all of us, is we were pushing out warmer air and bringing in colder air. Now, that's just going from terrible to terrible worse. I mean, it wasn't either way we were going to have the same thing. But you can kind of see right up here, this is a little higher elevation. You see this tree is still green, and you can see the freeze burn. And it's not all. There's some spots where either the wind moved through or there were gaps. And if you could get the wind to pass through your orchard, you, you, you didn't burn as much. Now, this looks like a fire hit this tree, but it's actually just frozen. That's what a freeze does to an avocado tree. Turns all the fruit black, takes all the leaves off. And, and so an avocado tree is kind of unique during the freeze. Um, you almost cut it back to nothing. Um, and so on a, on a tree like this, I will not have any fruit for two years. I have to cut it back, get new wood, that, and which won't produce fruit, but will produce new wood, and that new wood will produce fruit. And that happens every year, okay? And so you, it takes you out of business for a couple of years, um, if not completely, because some trees just don't recover. Um, now, the funny thing about, not the funny thing, but it's funny for me. Um, so you remember in 2003, we burned, and we burned about 5,000 acres, 5,000 feet of fence. Well, the fence that burned in 03 flooded out in 05. So, I, so when it burned, I replaced it. Then when it flooded, I replaced it. And then in 07, it burned again, the same damn fence. Darn fence. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> So that's, you know, after that, I'm like, I'm done. I'm not touching that fence, and nothing's happened ever since. So, <laughs> so I got some burned fence out there, but, uh, but it, I, I think it was just bad luck. So anyway, so, so let's talk about horses. That's a little unique to Ventura County. Um, thoroughbreds, um, that's all we handle. We handle uh, the Ferraris of horses. Uh, they're quick, they're not very smart, and they like to hurt themselves. That's, that's a horse. So we foal, we breed, we raise them, uh, we do everything but train them. And so uh, this cute little one, I, I, I love this picture, so I just thought I'd put it in there. Um, this this uh, weanling, yes, was there a question? Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, well, so obviously this is a newborn, uh, about 24 hours. Uh, they stand up within about 20 minutes, uh, nurse within about 21 minutes. Uh, they go right to business, and, and everything's usually pretty good. Uh, maybe one out of 25 or 30, you might have a problem. Uh, but... Um, you know, they've been doing this for eons without our help and, and have been pretty good. So with our help, it's even a little better. Um, so they'll go from basically a foaling barn, foaling stall, which is a 12 by 24, uh, eventually to a mare motel, which is a, a, this, where this little uh, lovely lad is with his mother. And um, we, we, we slowly give them more space because their legs are all over the place and you don't want them running around being too silly and hurting themselves. Uh, you want them to kind of grow as, grow up instead of out. Um, so these are some yearlings. Uh, so again, we go weanlings. So they're, a wean, they're actually a suckling until they're taken off their mom, then they're a weanling. And then they become a yearling, and then a two-year-old. And so we full, like I said, about 25 babies a year. Uh, typically, that's between February and June. And it's a, it's a pretty good, exciting time. Uh, we take care of our own horses and also, also uh, clients of ours. Um, the thoroughbred part of, of the business probably takes about 70% of my time, which, um, is a lot because it really is about 10% of our, our, our overall business. But again, if you're enjoying what you're doing, it, it doesn't really matter. Um, they're like kids. Um, they fight. Um, you can see right here, this horse is just right about ready to kick his face. And that's why he's kind of gent back. <laughs> <laughs> so we eventually, as yearlings, we separate the boys sooner than the girls. Uh, the boys seem to fight a lot more. They, they kick, they bite. Um, eventually, they'll do some harm to each other. 
So uh, at some point we have to separate them. Um, also, um, to give you an idea about um, thoroughbreds in general in the state, um, in the United States, there's 34,000 foals born every year in 2007. Okay, 34,000. In 2013, there's 21,000. So in six years, we've almost gone by about half our foal count in the United States. In California, 4,700 foals were born in 2007. In 2013, 2,300. So um, like anything, when you lose 50% of your, of your customers, there's some consolidation. There's um, uh, losses of farms. Um, the state has seen a, a closing of maybe five or six large farms. Um, and basically all that's due to the recession. Uh, the economics of, of horses are tough. Um, you know, it's a discretionary income type of, of deal, except for us because it's our business and we take care of them for those who have discretionary income. <laughs> but um, to give you an idea also, uh, just uh, California Chrome, I don't know if everybody's followed the Kentucky Derby this year. He's from California, first California horse ever to win the Kentucky Derby. Okay, and I did a little calculation because there's only one horse out of 21,000 that can win the Kentucky Derby. So you have a .00005 chance of winning the Kentucky Derby. <laughs> now, derbies are only for three-year-olds. And so you can only run in that race once in your lifetime. And so it's, it's, a, it's a one time shot. So we start training our horses or breaking them typically in October. Um, by then, they're, they're about 16, 17 months on the ground. Uh, what you may not know is every thoroughbred has the same birthday, and that's January 1st. Okay? So um, in racing, we race for age, what we say, what we call race for age, that two-year-olds get to run against two-year-olds, three-year-olds get to run against three-year-olds, but once you're four, you get to run against everybody. So it's advantageous to be born in February instead of June, because as a two-year-old, you may have 18 months on the ground versus 22 months on the ground. And at that, you know, we all have young kids, right? There's a big difference when they're two and three, but not so much when they're 14 and 15. So everybody tries to have an early foal, which means you have to breed early, and, and it's cyclical. Um, mare's uh, gestation period is 340 days. So, um, you know, you can't always go, you always can't always get a February breeding, a January fall, February breeding. It just doesn't happen. That, you know, it's, there's humanity in there and not every, but so eventually you might miss a year. Or you, you'll do some things. Um, at our ranch, we never put anybody on their back. Uh, it's a workman's comp nightmare. You just, you just don't want to deal with that. It's a whole other side of the business. But what we do is uh, we do some work in the round pen. And what that involves is putting a saddle on a horse. It's the first time they ever had something underneath their belly. Uh, it's, it's traumatic for them. They buck. They kick. They don't like it. It's foreign. It's just not something that's, that's a whole lot of fun for them. Nor the guy in the ring with them. <laughs> but we get through it. Um, they also, uh, we also uh, lunge line them so they get used to the, um, something in their mouth and some type of control like a bit. And, um, and that helps to the next stage where we eventually will send them to another farm that will specialize in, in, in riding the horse, uh, working with it, uh, making sure that it enjoys what it's doing. Because um, no matter what, a sour horse won't do anything, uh, just what that horse wants to do. And so just like, just like anything else, you, you have to work together. And, and some, horses, uh, some horses succeed and some don't, <laughs> right? And to give you an idea, probably 65% of the foals that are born race, okay? And of those 65%, probably 80 to 70% will win a race, right? So there's some out there that, that will get to the track and just never win a race, and there's some that will never uh, race. And, um, and that's okay, too, because horses get to be horses in other, in other venues. When they're done racing, our horses come back to the farm. We retrain them, and they're, they're hunters, they're jumpers, they're dressage horses, they're kids' horses. Um, because of the way we take care of our horses, they're, they're so well handled that they're um, – that they understand that how to be calm, and, that, and that's really important uh, for a horse. Filming is another aspect of our business um, in the ranches, uh, especially for us in Piru, because we're close to in the zone. Um, for those that don't know, there's a 30-mile zone. You know the show TMZ? That means 30-mile zone. Ah, huh, see? That's uh, basically the area that, that, the, uh, that the union allows um, a non 
stipend pay over and above the total normal income of, of what you get as a filmmaker or a film worker. So we're just outside, but we get exempted every now and then, depending on the show. Um, and so just like any good marketing person, I, I kind of stretch the truth a little bit because we're kind of in the zone, but we're really not. But um, it's, it's, a, it's a lot of fun. I always tell people it's kind of like your mother-in-law. You're happy to see her, but you're happier to see her go. That's, that's filming. <laughs> you enjoy having them, but the, the, the minute they're there, you want them to go. So um, at, at our property, what do we do? We, we grow lemons, avocados, uh, blackberries, um, our Alessi of ours, um, spinach, and celery. Those are the main crops that, 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 that are grown in Piru that seem to work pretty well. Um, we have a small grower up at the top um, that does organic herbs. And I was in the uh, Whole Foods in uh, Ox, Oxnard, the new one, and, and there they were. I was kind of proud about that, so I took a picture. Um, but I really had nothing to do with that. Um, a, a little bit about, about uh, kind of the ag in, in Ventura County. And, and what we do is really, in essence, we grow a commodity. Uh, we're, we're subject to global markets, not just local markets, not just um, state markets. It, it's, it's, a, it's a huge interconnected um, business. And so, you know, I don't know if you've ever been to uh, Dodger Stadium and had a Dodger dog, right? Okay, it's the best hot dog you ever had in your life, right? But you take that hot dog home, and it's a hot dog. Right? It didn't change, but your perception did. Right? And so that's, that's what the Avocado Commission has been able to do. They've been able to say, make California avocados like a Dodger dog. It's something unique and different. And so when you can do that with a commodity, which is what most of us grow, uh, it, it's special and it's beneficial. Now, my lemons, I'm just sorry, but they're just lemons. I mean, <laughs> there's nothing special about them. They're, you know, I like to say that they're, mine are prettier than everyone else is, right? But, but they aren't. I mean, they're, they're lemons. So. Um, so we have to be careful in, in how we deal with business and, and globally in our markets and regulatory agencies and all those kind of things. This is my little push. Um, because it, it, at some point, the marketer only cares about getting a lemon. They don't really care where it came from at some point. Now, the consumer does at times, but not enough. And so we're always concerned about what's happening in the world. Um, um, you know, Ojai Pixies, that's a good example, right? You could grow Pixies anywhere, but they've made a brand out of what they've done, and, and people look for it. And that's, that's what it's all about, when you can take a commodity and make it special. Um, but I'd, I'd say probably the most important thing that we do at all on the ranch, and probably much like what you have here, it, it comes down to the people, right? Um, we're, I, I'm nothing without the people. Um, we are a zero business without people and you're in the people business too. And that's a goofy business because I've been at the counter and I've listened to some of the things that people say to you guys and I'm like, Oh my God, <laughs> sorry. Uh, um, but so it's, it's, we all deal with different things, right? And, but at the end of the day, it's people and that's, that's a unique business. But, um, you know, I was trying to see if I grew any hair left since that was 10 years ago and I didn't, I haven't gotten any, um, but you just can't fake that smile. I mean, that's, you know, that's, if you had that smile at work every day, we, we'd all be fine, you know, and that's, and that's what I try and do. I, I try to make sure that everybody I work with has that smile. I want to make sure that I can have that smile, and, and you know, it's what, it's what you'd like to do as well. And the only way you do that is, is by treating people well, being fair, consistent, all right? Um, and and that's, that's the greatest thing, you know, I, if, if I could do anything for any of the people that I work with, and they walk away with that smile, I'm good. I know I, I did the right thing. So what's next? Um, I know you think I would have learned my lesson, right? Don't, don't get stay, stray out of agriculture, but I'm opening up a pizza place. <laughs> so that's, that's what's next for us in Piru. We're opening up uh, a little pizza place for the ice cream shop. I know. <laughs> But, uh, you know, I, I love Piru. I, I love where I work. I love the people I work with. And um, I thought, you know what, it, it's a good thing for the community. If you haven't been to Piru, it's a little quiet, a little dead. Some people uh, say it's 60 miles and 60 years from Los Angeles. <laughs> but um, it's a little town that's sometimes forgotten, but the people there have so much pride, and, and they should. And um, so we're going to open up a, a little pizza place. Hopefully it will break even. And... Um, 
provide some training for some of the guys in town, the kids, you know, give them a place to start working and counting money and earning and, and, and learning some things from people. And, um, and so I'm, I'm looking, you know, hopefully he'll have that same guy will smile when he eats the pizza. I haven't figured out the recipe yet, but we're going to get there. So um, that's, that's uh, Ranch of Temescal. Um, that's, you know, that's what we've been doing for the last 12 years. And I, I really appreciate it. Like I said, I, you know, I come in this business, in this building a lot of times. And, and you know what, I've, I've been treated very well. I've been treated fairly. Um, there's some times that you bang your head against the wall and go, why? But, um, you know, most of the time people, there's, there's always somebody that's willing to work it out with you and figure it out. And so I appreciate that. So I would just say to you, keep, you know, when there's problems, just remember those two guys that were smiling. Those are the guys at the end of the permit. Sometimes those are the ones that we're trying to get, get that business up and running for, for them. And, um, you know, if you keep that in mind when you're doing stuff, that, that'd be really nice. So I appreciate your time. Yeah. The question was about water and, and scarcity. I was told to repeat questions so that, that we get it. Um, you know, it's it's so diverse. Every situation, every farmer um, regionally has different issues. And so the issues that we have in Piru are not the issues that are in Oxnard or Santa Paula or Fillmore. And I think what happens, uh, farmers by nature are somewhat um, kind of tight-chested, close-fisted. Um, they they don't want everybody to know what they're all doing, even though we're all doing the same thing. And so water is critical. I mean, without water, we're out of business. And, and there's a lot of people that are going to be out of jobs. And so I think what people are trying to do is figure out how they can stay in business with what the resources they have, how best they can do it. Um, you know, what's interesting is, is five years ago, I was driving up the five, and I saw a lot of fallow ground. And, and I go, gosh, you know, that's going to happen to Ventura County one day. And today's the day. But we're not unique. You can go to Central California, you can see 40% unemployment. You can see people that are out of jobs. And to think that we're special or unique in that situation, no, we're just the last in line. Um, what we're going to face here are issues that people have already faced and much bigger. But we'll probably have some ground that goes out of production. Um, we will have some people that will be better farmers. Right? I mean, that's, that's the deal. You have a, def a definitive resource. You have to figure out how to do better. I mean, that's, that's the way of America. That's manufacturing. You have to do better with the resources you have. That's what you do in this building. Right? Recession, you lost a lot of people. Now things are picking up. You don't necessarily have more people. You just have to be better at what you do. Right? And that, I would equate that to water. I mean, we have to have it, but we have to be better with what we do. And, and that just, that's, sometimes it's a good thing. Yeah. Wow. Thank you again, Tim. Thank you. I uh, appreciate it. Get everybody on time? Yeah.